grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus the Christ. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church here on this Reformation Sunday. I am Jenny Simmons Ellis, interim pastor for this congregation. Where our mission statement calls us to be and make disciples of Jesus Christ, disciples who know the Lord and who, through love, serve God and others. We believe ourselves to be an inclusive and caring church, passionate about helping others in our community and in the world, and we invite you to join us. As you see, there's room, so invite your friends to come and be with us as we worship. I do invite you, if you're new and would like to stop by the welcome desk, you can get more information about the church. You could pick up a welcome bag, and if you'd like to, you can pick up a hearing assist headset, which people tell me works extremely well, even with a hearing aid, and that's good news. At the end of your aisles, there is a friendship pad, which you can use to pick up and pass across the aisle, fill out the information, but pass it back so that you can greet people by name. If it's someone you don't know, this is a good chance to introduce yourself. I'll call attention to some announcements. The first one is that on November 14th, we will have a congregational meeting for the purpose of electing elders. As some of you know, we have not had a quorum on the session recently, but after that election, we hope to have a full component of 12 elders. That meeting will be on Zoom at 1 o'clock on the afternoon of November 14th. And in your first news, you'll see instructions of how to register for that meeting. We hope you will make plans to attend that. On Tuesday, the women's Tuesday morning women's Bible study meets here in the Youth Center at 915. There will be no handbell rehearsal this week, but the choir will rehearse at 7 in the choir room as usual. The men's Bible study is in person at 7.30 in the morning on Friday. Um, next Sunday, by the way, change your clocks. Daylight savings time ends, so you'll have more evening time. And the Faith Journey Adult Sunday School class meets um, on Sunday mornings at 8.30. If you have any questions about any of these announcements, feel free to um, call the church office for more information. I invite you to join me now in the call to worship. You should see the words on the screens. In the peace and bustle of our life, the sounds of God's creation running wave and restless earth, flowing air and spinning stars, these declare the Son of Peace. In the activity and stillness of an ancient church, the cries of a broken world, angry and hopeful cries, hungry, unending cries, these proclaim the cross of Christ. In the silence and turmoil of our hearts, the voice of the Risen One, Comfort to the sufferer, challenge to the follower, the call of Christ to all. We come to worship Jesus Christ today. Let us worship God.
Welcome, and today is Reformation Sunday. Not only is it Kirkin of the Tartans, but it is a day that we celebrate how the church has grown and changed as it seeks to be Christ's body on earth. This church that we know and love today, First Presbyterian Church of St. Petersburg, did not come by accident. We stand on the shoulders of countless generations who have sought to love and serve God, interpret the scriptures, and work out their faith in their particular service celebrates our theological legacy by taking a journey through the PCUSA Book of Confessions. Some of you may be very familiar with the confessions, and some of you may know nothing about them. The confessions are simply statements of faith, the efforts of various people at various times to lift up summary relevant to their day, a summary of what Christianity calls us to say and do. These confessions are now an official part of our constitution as Presbyterians, meaning they guide and shape our life together. Pastors and elders vow to be guided by them. These confessional statements are not scripture and do not, and we do not believe or follow every single word they say, but they do give witness to the journey our forebears have taken in gifting us with the church we know today. As we prepare to journey from the earliest Christian church to present day, I invite you to dedicate your heart, mind, and spirit for this to this service, joining me in a unison prayer. Lord, give us open ears to hear your voice in the voices of our ancestors. Give us open minds to understand what they experienced and believed. Give us open hearts to accept what you might be saying to us today as we leaf through the history of your church. Guide us into writing new chapters for ourselves and the church of the future. In your holy name we pray. Amen. It was back in 381 AD. The Emperor Constantine had declared Christianity the one true unified religion of the Roman Empire. But he found that Christianity was anything but unified. Constantine had already convened one council to try to bring some other to this unruly, some order to this unruly young religion. But Christians with different perspectives on the divinity of Jesus continued to fight, sometimes with their pens and sometimes with their fists. And so in 381, another council came together and adopted the Nicene Creed. This creed shares much language with the Apostles' Creed, which we may know a little better, in fact, the Nicene is used even now by creedal Christians in diverse traditions across the world. Let us responsibly proclaim what our ancestors have long believed, beginning in unison. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us, for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. 
he suffered dead and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who is spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. After the Nicene Council under Constantine, and for nearly 1,500 years, the Catholic Church grew and spread across the globe. While the Catholic Church underwent change and transformation, it managed to mostly hang together until an earthquake hit it an earthquake called the Protestant Reformation. On October 31st, 1517, 504 years ago today, Martin Luther publicly nailed his 95 complaints to a church on a church door in Wittenberg, Germany, sparking debate and controversy that would eventually lead to new and even more diverse ways of being the church. The Roman Catholic Church faced huge change. For the church, that was not an easy time, and the reformers like Martin Luther were not always the heroes we have made them out to be. So lest we get too puffed up, up celebrating our own family line, let us stop now and confess our sins together asking God for mercy and pardon. Let us pray together. Holy and gracious God, we confess today to the same sins that have always plagued your church. We are too stuck in our ways, too resistant to your spirit, too attracted to power and privilege, too quick to build up walls, too slow to build bridges. Send more reformation our way until we are formed perfectly by you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. Sin has always been at work in this world, yet God's grace meets it toe to toe. We believe that when the story is over, it will be forgiveness that will have the last word. In Christ, we are forgiven. Now, as often as we come before him, alleluia, amen. And now we will sing a hymn Martin Luther himself wrote in the late 1520s. This is a hymn of strength and solace for the challenges Luther and his fellow reformers faced, and it has brought much comfort through five centuries. So let us stand, if you are able, and sing together with the praise band, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
Tartans, or depending on your brogue, the Kirken O the Tartans, as it's written in the um, list out back. Scotland is, in many ways, the homeland of our part of the Reformed movement. Scotland is where John Knox developed a church led by elders who were chosen by the voice of local congregations. Today, we are observing the Kirking, or the churching, of the Tartans. Back in part of Scotland's history, England conquered Scotland, and as conquerors, they outlawed the clans of Scotland, the fierce and warlike family groups that threatened England's power over the Scots. Part of England's edict was that tartan banners and kilts could not be taken into the Kirk. In response, the fiercely independent Scots Presbyterians would carry a piece of their tartan into worship. This is called the Kirking of the Tartans. It is what we recognize today in carrying tartan banners into our church. Our collection of banners represents some of our own congregation's family backgrounds, as you can see on the list available at the welcome desk. One unusual banner, which is in the middle of the windows back here, has been added this year, a banner that is not a Scottish tartan, but an African fabric offered in our worship as a symbol that all are welcome here, not just those of Scottish or European heritage. As the Reformation spread, the movement reached Britain, where the Scots Confession was written, in Scotland, of course. In 1560, in the course of just four days, the Scots Confession was developed. It was a time of political turbulence. The Scots Confession declares God's everlasting power over the Kirk, the Scottish word for church, and indeed the whole world. This is what our ancestors proclaimed. If you could join in unison, the Scots Confession. As we believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, so we firmly believe that from the beginning there has been, now is, and to the end of the world shall be one Kirk. That is to say, one company and multitude of people chosen by God who rightly worship and embrace him by true faith in Christ Jesus, who is the only head of the Kirk, 
even as it is the body and spouse of Christ Jesus. This kirk is Catholic, that is, universal, because it contains the chosen of all ages, of all realms, nations, and tongues, be they of the Jews or be they of the Gentiles who have communion and society with God the Father and with his Son, Christ Jesus. Through the sanctification of his Holy Spirit, it is therefore called the communion, not of profane persons, but of saints, who as citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem have the fruit of inestimable benefits. One God, one Lord Jesus, one faith, and one baptism. Friends, since God has given so freely to us, let us give freely to God and to God's church that we might continue to be a beacon of faith. Even though some are still physically separated, we know that in so many ways we are still deeply connected. In our connection, we have concerns about the ongoing ministries of our church and about the welfare of our ministries and our staff. The financial strength of the church remains dependent on the generosity of us all. Beloved, we ask you to continue to give with open and generous hearts. If you are worshiping here today in the sanctuary, there are offering plates at the exit doors where you can safely place your gifts. If you are worshiping online, you may give through the homepage of the church website. You may send your checks in the U.S. mail, or you may leave them in the mail slot in the office door. However you choose to give, we thank you for supporting the work of God's church at First Presbyterian in St. Petersburg. Let us pray. God of provision, gather our offerings and add your blessing so that all may be satisfied, so that all the hungry may be fed, so that nothing is lost and no one left behind. Amen.
generation after the Reformation, a group of English theologians gathered to create a new confession. Over the course of more than a thousand meetings, does that sound Presbyterian or not? Those theologians produced, created what we know as the Westminster Confession. 
And in addition, during this period, two catechisms were produced, one for preachers by a professor of divinity and the other for children by a professor of mathematics. So the following questions were for children to memorize, children to memorize. Using the words on the screen, we can ask ourselves the sum of the same questions our ancestors asked. The first question, question one, what is the chief and highest end of humanity, of man? Humanity's chief and highest end is to glorify God and fully to enjoy God forever. Question 33 was, what is justification? Justification is an act of God's free grace wherein the right governs all sins and accepts us as righteous in God's sight only for the righteousness of God Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. Then question 35 was, what is sanctification? Sanctification is the work of God's free grace whereby we are renewed in the whole person after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and live unto righteousness. I did not teach those to my children. Oh well. Trusting in that love that the church has known through all these generations, that peace, that joy, and that grace, let us come now to lift the prayers of this day to God. God of grace and God of glory, you have poured your power on us, your people. We pray now in your holy name as generations have prayed before us for the joys and concerns of our days, knowing that you care for great and small. We pray for creation, for the earth and all its wonders. We pray with joy for the changing of the seasons, the beauty of the leaves, and for cooler days. We pray for your mercy on those who battle the forces of nature, for victims of hurricanes and fires and earthquakes and floods, for those who cannot access clean water or find shelter from the elements. We pray for the life of the nations, ours included, we pray for leaders and for those in power that they may use that power on behalf of the powerless to seek tolerance and compromise, to listen for the wisdom of your guidance and to exercise mutual respect. We pray for an end to state-based violence and that we might see our way to a different kind of future. We pray today for the church as it gathers in a million different forms. We pray for mega churches, for churches like our own and for house churches, for congregations gathered in historic cathedrals and in strip mall storefronts, for the church on every continent, for Christians of every denomination and tradition. We pray for the deeply committed and for those just on the beginning steps of faith. We pray that in our diversity, all might find a home that fits them and that we might remember our ultimate unity is in you, a unity born of your love, and that we might work towards reconciliation, towards becoming your one church in the world, your one body here on earth. We pray for those who struggle today because of illness or grief, especially for Peter, for Jean, for Judy, for Henry, for Mark, for Molly, and so many others. We pray for those who have a lack of opportunity or a lack of resources, for those who suffer abuse and oppression and malaise and hopelessness or helplessness. We pray that you would show us what spiritual gifts we might offer each one that we might be mutually encouraged. 
So we pray for the gifts of healing for the sick, comfort for the grieving, love for the lonely, and support for the beaten down. We pray for food for the hungry and faith for the lost. By your grace, soothe suffering, bring renewal in tired lives. We pray now each of us for those close to our own hearts. We lift all these and every other prayer to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. And now as we pray, we use the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Historians talk about the Reformation as a closed era in the past, but we Presbyterians who tell God's story know that God is always forming and reforming the church. We call ourselves the church the church reformed, always being reformed, because we know the church is always changing. So now we look for a moment at how the church has responded to events in our own lifetimes. Back in 1934, the Nazi party was on the rise in Germany, initiating a reign of cruelty, hate, and terror in Germany and in Europe. And many German Christians saw no problem with Hitler's actions, declaring that their faith and their patriotism went hand in hand, thinking that Hitler's rule was God's will. A few Christians of that time, however, resisted the pressure to merge Hitler's politics with the Christian faith. And so representatives from the Reformed and the Lutheran and United Churches gathered to create a confession of faith that they could send to their fellow German Christians, urging them to display their freedom in Christ by standing firm against Hitler's designs for Germany. And so those spiritual ancestors of ours wrote what we call, what we know as the Barman Declaration. While our situation is not the same as theirs was in 1934, we can confess the eternal truth that the church was not meant to be co-opted by political forces. The church clings only to Jesus Christ. So let's lift up today a portion of the Barman Declaration. See what you think of this affirmation and notice the phrase, the false doctrine refers to our thinking that the Christian faith is the same as with the current political leadership or the general value system of our culture. The Barman Declaration says in part, the Christian church is the congregation of the people in which Jesus Christ acts presently as the Lord in word and sacrament through the Holy Spirit. As the church of pardoned sinners, it has to testify in the midst of a sinful world with its faith as with its obedience, with its message as with its order. That the church is solely the property of Jesus Christ and that it lives and wants to live solely from his comfort and from his direction in the expectation of Christ's appearance. We reject the false doctrine as though the church were permitted to abandon the form of its message and order to its own pleasure or to changes in prevailing ideology and political conviction. Later, there were hard in our own country. The 1960s turned America upside down, some of us 
remember those days. In the midst of many different cultural tensions and conflicts, the Northern Presbyterian Church adopted a new confession based around the idea that in Christ, the whole world is reconciled to God. This was called the Confession of 1967. This is another document you might like to read. And in another place in our world, in 1986, during the time of apartheid in South Africa, in this time, people were separated and treated socially and legally on the basis of their color and race. The unfairness of apartheid raged for many years in South Africa. Some white Christians used scripture to justify this system. In protest, the Dutch Reformed Church courageously wrote the Belhar Confession. This document, now part of our own book of confessions, insists that God's vision for humanity is one of liberation, equality, unity, and communion. The Belhar Confession was written by our theological ancestors, originally written in Afrikaans, one of the languages of South Africa. Let us listen to the words of our ancestors. We believe that God has revealed God's self as the one who wishes to bring about justice and true peace among people. That God in a world full of injustice and enmity is in a special way the God of the destitute, the poor, and the wronged. That God calls the church to follow him in this, for God brings justice to the oppressed and gives bread to the hungry. That God frees the prisoner and restores sight to the blind. That God supports the downtrodden, protects the stranger, helps orphans and widows and blocks the path of the ungodly. That for God, pure and undefiled religion is to visit the orphans and the widows in their suffering. That God wishes to teach the church to do what is good and to seek the right. That the church must therefore stand by people in any form of suffering and need, which implies, among other things, that the church must witness against and strive against any form of injustice so that justice may roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That the church, as the possession of God, must stand where the Lord stands, namely against injustice and with the wronged. That in following Christ, the church must witness against all the powerful and privileged who selfishly seek their own interests and thus control and harm others. We have looked at the story of our reformed faith from early days until now. And now we lift up one of our traditional hymns, The Church's One Foundation, written back in 1866. This hymn expresses both lament for the disunity of the church and a heartfelt hope for all the church might yet be. This will serve as our recessional hymn as the choir and then the St. Andrew's pipe and the drum band leave the sanctuary. Please remember that you are invited to gather outside on the front patio to enjoy some tunes by the St. Andrew's pipe and drum band after our service. Let us join in sing, singing this final hymn together and please stand if you are able. Hymn number 321, Our Church's One Foundation.
one. By the right. Quick. Hard. service by speaking of 1983, when the Northern and Southern Presbyterian churches in America had just reunited. Presbyterians celebrated that we had become a new church, the Presbyterian Church USA, and lifted up the faith and the future of this new church with a new confession written to be used in worship. The brief statement of faith reminds us that the church is not meant to be a hiding place from the world, but a blessing to the world. And so as we go forth and carry on our legacy of our ancestors and to write a new chapter in God's story, let us use the words of these more recent ancestors as today's benediction and charge. The words will be shown on the screen. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of people long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. So now as you go forth from this place, go with the love of God who created you, the peace of Christ who saved you, and the Holy Spirit who reforms, renews, and refreshes you today, tomorrow, and evermore. Amen and amen. Go in peace.